Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and expert mail sorter, and I'm joined as always by Scott Daly, who at this very moment is bringing in a giant sack of mail. Scott? <sighs> yeah. Hang on, let me... Let me catch my breath. Oh, that bag. That's really heavy, man. Whew. Okay. <laughs> yes. As you said, this is the podcast where you... Oh, my God. A worm expert guide me, a first-time reader through Wild Bo's world of superheroes, supervillains, and everything in between as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week... After finishing up another saga of the worm story, um, we decided it was time for another Q&A session we call uh, the mailbag. This time it's called Mailbag 3. This time there's mail. Again. But that's not all, Matt. Tell them what else they've won. Why, Scott? It's a brand new car interview with Rain, producer and actor of the Worm Audiobook Project. Uh, Rain was nice enough to sit down with us for about half an hour and chat about what it was like to put this project together, the biggest hurdles, and what he's going to do next. Wow, that sounds so amazing. I can't wait to listen to that, even though it was recorded over two weeks ago. Yeah, and we did it. Um, <laughs> but but first, uh, we've got some things to take care of here. Uh, before we get into these questions, I think we just wanted to take a second and acknowledge some of the really incredible comments that we got from last week's episode. Uh, these people didn't ask any specific questions that we could work uh, in, uh, their, their posts into, but they they said some very smart and insightful stuff that we just wanted to to call out. Um, Scott, did you want to did you want to uh, do the first one? Yeah, sure. Um, I, some of these people did have questions, and I think we're going to get to some of their questions too. But I wanted to call out their stuff too. This this person is a name that is Jo 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 Eight. <laughs> um, I think I think that's the name. Yeah. Um, I think this this listener just uh, said that they were kind of surprised that we didn't mention how both Emma and Leeson's origin are a little mirrored in each other. Um, both are upper class children who went through a traumatic experience, and as a result of their traumas, decided to abandon parts of their old lives and rebuild themselves as someone else. Uh, Emma decided to build herself up by tearing Taylor down, and Lisa chose to to build herself up by building Taylor up and making her life even better when she didn't have to. And I just wanted to call this out because I, as soon as this person said this, I was like, yeah, of course, that's, that's brilliant. I didn't think of that. Um, but they're absolutely right. Um, and, and they mentioned that it ties into the themes of what you do after you experience trauma is what defines who you are. And I think that's very true. And, and that's that's a, a great reflection on these two different characters. Although um, I still think in keeping with some of the worm themes that you could say that uh, was what Lisa did for Taylor. I mean, she's definitely trying to build her up. But was it helpful to her in the long run? Was it was it more placating her and giving her what she thinks she needed at the time? Was it actually what Taylor, what was the healthiest thing for Taylor at the time? Yeah, I, I think maybe Lisa's, uh, Lisa's behavior was coming from a better place, but uh, it didn't necessarily have a better outcome. It's too soon to say, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and this also kind of uh, something that I, I didn't mention on the podcast, it, it, but this kind of jumped me to another thought, which is that how kind of both Emma and noel kind of linked together a little bit too and because you you know you're thinking why did wild Bo put this emma chapter where it is and there's reasons i think that are going to tie into stuff we get into next week but there's also a, a pretty good parallel between emma and noel and how they're these people that have become transformed uh one of them uh, literally one of them figuratively and become almost this new thing um as as a way of processing the trauma and the terrible thing that happened to them. I think that's a pretty cool connect there too. Yeah. There's, there's a ton of connections between, between characters in, in these arcs specifically where you're contrasting how different people handle trauma. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So another comment from Sarah Graug, Sarah Graug. Um, uh, basically this is another comment about Emma's behavior. Um, and, and this person points out that, in, in trying to avoid becoming weak, uh, Emma's coping mechanism actually makes her weak. Um, and, and, and furthermore that the story seems to keep the responsibility for Emma's actions squarely on her shoulders, which is contrasted 
uh, with how Alec's backstory is presented where, where Alec has actually done worse things than Emma objectively. Um, but the story raised more questions about how much choice he really had in, in those actions. And, um, essentially, you know, specifically in terms of the psychological effects of what was done to him by his dad and the, you know, just the fact that he comes from a mind control family. Um, so it's, it's furthering this theme of, of free will and what it means to have agency and responsibility in, in this story, which we've seen in many places we've seen with the, with the Seamurg and, and, and its influence on the travelers. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and we're seeing it again here. Yeah. I, I, this person I think specifically said that they, uh, had been following us since the beginning, but had never commented before. Um, mm-hmm. and this was such a good comment. I want to be like, please do so more often. Like this yeah. is great. Um, and yeah, I, I really like this a lot. And I, I like, like we talked about last week about how um, we understood Emma, but we still kind of hated her. And I think uh, this is just a, a much cleaner and better way of saying that, of, of describing why exactly that is. It's because, yes, you understand the things that happened to her, but she always had agency. She was always aware of the choices that she was making and was always the one making those choices. So yeah. Um, you, you, you understand, um, you get why she is the way she is, but the, the blame does still kind of rest on her shoulders. And that's why, that's why you still just be like, Emma, you suck. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, so we also got a really nice email, uh, from, uh, Julio or, or Julio. Um, and this, this user, this, this person pointed out, a, a theme that they think is not getting enough attention. And that theme is communication. Um, basically, you know, they point out one of the pervasive tropes in superhero fiction is we have two characters meet and at first they mistake each other for enemies and they fight and then they realize that they should be friends and they need to team up and fight the real bad guy. I mean, this happens in, in, uh, the, the first Avengers movie, yeah. for example, and everything, um, and, yeah. and everything forever. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, the, the problem could have been resolved sooner if they just talked to each other, which is, which is, you know, a, a trope and, and something that Taylor thinks about specifically, in fact, in this last arc. Um, and, and they go on to say if from the beginning, it's clear that Taylor isn't good at communicating in the first chapter, she has a very well-researched project about the effect of capes in the world, but she's showed up by one of her bullies who delivers a more shallow, but more entertaining presentation. Taylor is a very like fact oriented person. Um, and, and when her feelings are involved, it makes her, it it makes it difficult for her to express her own needs to others. Her relationship with her dad is damaged because they can't talk honestly about grief and the bullies get away with their behavior, partly because they're better at talking and about lying to authority. Uh, Taylor's selective empathy and solipsistic tendencies make it hard for her to understand that other people want different things from her, which strains every interaction she has because she hears only the material that is being spoken and not the substance. Um, and she, and she, and she tends to assign motives that aren't there. I'm, I'm just kind of reading huge chunks of this cause it's, it's so it's, good. It's, it's, great. <laughs> it's yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, they finish up by saying that her power is an extension of this because it allows her to bypass a need to explain herself and the bugs essentially do everything she wants without thought. Um, so being in her, in her swarm makes her feel small and safe, but it's actually just expressing a repetition of her desires a million times over. And it's a universe of only herself, which is, I think a beautiful way of saying that. Yeah. I, th- I mean, Julio, that was, I think better than I could have ever said it. So well done. Uh, we, we really like, I don't even have anything to say except for that was a great comment. And that's why we wanted to share it with everyone else because it was really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we've ever named the theme of communication per se, but, uh, I'm sure it's, it's come up. Yeah. It's it, come it, up. It's but, definitely come up. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I think we, we should make a, a conscious effort to, to note that more going forward. Sure. Yeah. All right. I think it's question time. Um, it is. Yeah. But before we get into this, we have a disclaimer. You guys asked a ton of questions. A shit ton, Matt. Yes, literally. Uh, so, yeah, this week uh, we got more questions than we've ever gotten on any of the previous mailbags. Um, all this means is that we were forced to cut some, sadly. A lot of you asked multiple questions. So we tried to pick one or two uh, of your set that we thought we had the most to say on. So if your question didn't get answered, we're really sorry. Um, uh, Scott, let's get one question out of the way real quick. This one was asked by no less than, uh, I think, uh, 17,000 in individual people. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen next? I don't know. All right, let's move on. All right. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and, and I will say if, if we did cut a question, it's likely that it was just because we didn't have anything interesting to say. It wasn't because it wasn't an, a, good, a good question. Yeah. And, and I think we are going to touch a little bit on like at the end of this arc or end of this episode, we are going to do my usual. What does the arc name mean? Which I think we'll touch on a little bit of where I think the story in the immediate future is going. But um, I don't want to make specific speculations on where the story is going and and speaking too broadly isn't too interesting like i think it's a perfectly valid question that everyone that a lot of people asked us but um on the one hand you can't really participate in that at all because Mm -hmm. you you know um and on the other it, it would really just be me like blindly trying to make stuff up or being so broad to the where it's not an entertaining answer but we'll we'll touch on it a little at the very end of the episode but yeah yeah the protagonist will face struggles exactly yeah conflict (laughs) all right so so let's just go go through these questions scott so on the reddit kifru uh asks uh what are our favorite uh wild bow wildebeest uh misnames uh and uh and then yeah so so first uh i liked uh uh and and i think i actually laughed out loud at at uh, wild boy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like this a lot. I like that. I stumbled upon this thing when people just started like making comments and reviews using names. And I was like, what's going on here? Um, it, it's a fun thing. I think I like too, because it's just like, I feel like I have to read every single one of those. And that makes yeah. me laugh every time I have to do it. Yeah. Um, and would you rather fight one echidna sized skitter or four skitter sized echidnas? Couldn't like four skitter sized echidnas just eat a bunch of stuff and become four echidna sized echidnas? Like, couldn't yep. that just be a thing that happened? I feel like that would probably be worse. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely thinking in terms of how these powers work, Scott. And I think Skitter's power doesn't get any stronger just because she's like giant, right? It's just that's true. She still just controls bugs. So yeah, yeah. I and guess I'd right. rather fight fight Skitter, which is weird because she could just rip my arteries open. <laughs> And and there's no advantage to having four skitters. Like one skitter right. is as good as four. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> from Sir Graug on the Reddit, you speculated a bit on how hard it is to determine where Taylor's arc will end up with the constant oscillation between heroic and more villainous actions. But where do you think the other Undersiders' arcs will wind up at the end of the story? Uh, where do you think they're headed? Will they survive or not? Okay, so let's go through them one by one, shall we? Um, yeah. starting with Brian, I feel like Brian is going to end up dead and sooner rather than later. Um, I just think he's gotten to a place where I don't know how much left there is to do with the character. I'm sure there's some stuff I haven't thought of yet, but it just seems like we're getting to a point where Brian has been so royally fucked up by everything that's happened to him that, um, he is damaged in a way that is unrecoverable and he's going to get himself in a situation. Maybe he's going to set out to prove himself in a way or uh or or just be or just switch to a a reckless type of brian we've never seen before because he just doesn't care anymore and he's gonna get himself killed so that's my guess for that um lisa is in a really interesting place right now because her crazy ass plan which that's something i don't think we did uh, touch on sufficiently enough last week was that everything that lisa did the last arc was insane and the fact that it all worked and it worked almost the exact way that she planned it to work um, only kind of reinforces that kind of behavior in her in the future. And I wonder if that's going to get her in some serious trouble. Um, and, you know, it, I think it's easy to say, like, she has this moment where she reveals to Taylor her trigger event and she reveals to Taylor why she was with her. And like from on the surface, this this feels like a growth moment for her. But if you think about it, it's really it's really not. It doesn't change her in any fundamental way it doesn't change her primary motivations she still hasn't really moved past her core trauma and her need to prove that she knows everything and is the smartest person in the room that all is still there she just uh came clean to taylor about it so um i don't know if she ends up dead or anything but i think we're gonna see her get in trouble because of this need um that we've seen in this last arc um rachel i don't know rachel's in like rachel's interesting because i think she's come really far but i feel like her every step that she's taken is like hanging out on the edge of a knife and and one bad thing goes wrong one perceived uh 
act of treachery and she could fall back and be even worse than she was before. So I don't know. Um, I, I, I hope that she continues to move forward and I, I see that for her, but I also think that Taylor acts recklessly sometimes and doesn't think about other people sometimes when she does some things or, or, or specific people. She does think about other people, just not uh, the same people. And uh, I think it could get her in, in trouble and, and ruin that relationship. And then Alec, I don't know. Alec's growth has been kind of hidden. It hasn't been center stage. Like you see it, we, we've kind of pointed out when it happened. Like there's a moment where he steps up and tries to to save Murden or, or he like is the one realizing what the appropriate behavior in this time is, even if he does it in a joking way. So like I could see him like... I, I could see a situation where Alec like sacrifices himself in some noble way as like a perfect completion of his arc. Like the, the sociopath who doesn't understand emotions, like finally becomes human just in the nick of time and saves another human life in doing so. I could see that happening. Um, and I didn't, I forgot to write Aisha down, <laughs> which is oops. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know with her. Like, I think she's becoming more of an adult. I think she's becoming more and more independent. And I think that's both good and bad because she's maturing in some ways and, and she's getting a lot of freedom in others that might lead to a dangerous spot. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like basically to sum up the answer is everyone's kind of in between going good or going bad at this point. And I think it's a very interesting time for all these guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you highlighted all of their core kind of, character struggles and mm -hmm. and uh so so yeah from mega fire 7 um do you think the undersiders ha uh, have a positive influence on the city is the city better off now than when they first claimed their territory uh, than when the story began i want to hear what you have to say about this first <laughs> i'm interested in your opinion on this um yeah i mean it's, i think it's it's debatable uh, in, in, in a number of ways. And I think that's kind of an interesting answer in and of itself because, um, you know, when, when the story began, we had, we had the ABB and, and the Empire 88, you know, roving and, and committing random acts of violence against people. Um, now obviously like we have all of this destruction from Leviathan. Um, but it's not, uh, you, you have a lot less like random violence. There's a lot less, uh, there's a lot more safety and security, but that's not like that's not everything that people want out of life. You know, they they, they want to have some sense that there there's going to be like stability of government and 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 uh, it, it doesn't really seem like a stable situation to have a supervillain gang running your city. So, yeah, like like I think I think there's an argument like for this exact moment that we're at uh, the average Brockton based citizen may may be a little bit optimistic but also probably fairly guarded uh, not only because of the fact that their city's been through so much. Yeah. And there's, there's an interesting uh, moment that happens in the Parahumans online chapter that we didn't really get into last week um, where someone is rating the different areas of Brockton Bay by five stars, you know, order of safety and security and, and where you would want to be. And someone rates Skidder's territory as five stars. And then someone else tells a story about how they were there. They got robbed um, then something happened to them. Like then something like they got money and their stuff returned magically the next day. Like obviously Skitter like fixed the problem for them. Mm -hmm. And then they say that the person after this left because they were uncomfortable with it. And it's this, this interesting note of, of showing that this issue is just way more complicated than it appears on the surface. Because I think on the surface, yes, it's safer. Like, skitter rules with like an iron fist she like doesn't fuck around you don't commit crimes in her territory or you get punished but you're absolutely right that there's something more and and and, and actually like adding up and being able to determine like would x have happened if they did y like all this stuff is is really hard to determine if you start looking past just the surface level of do I feel safer today than tomorrow like and I think that's the 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 thing that Clockblocker was trying to make the point that he was trying to make with with Taylor which is that you know you think you're doing these things for good but you never stop and and stay long enough to see the consequences so yes uh skitter ruling of her territory has produced a relatively safe place to live but but 
what are the costs of that that we can't see right now? And that's what I think is important to, to, to stay with as we go through this. Yeah. It, it gets to that accountability question where the heroes have their, their hands are frequently tied because they have this, uh, this accountability to the people through, through the, through the protectorate, um, which Taylor views as like an unnecessary, you know, hindrance and, and, and just inefficiency. And even the wards themselves are sometimes like, well, why, you know, our hands are so tied. It's so frustrating, but it's like, yeah, I mean, the only way to, to make the people comfortable with the parahumans is to give them this level of accountability. Otherwise it is kind of just a terrifying status quo. Right. Because like, as much as like, and I think that's that's what we're going to be seeing going forward is, you know, Leviathan came, shit happened, Skitter stepped up and protected people. And so in this time of crisis, yes, you feel safer, you like what she's done. But as we start to move towards a long term solution, as as this, the city has now come back, the city, beca- uh, largely ca- because of Lisa's portal, Brockton Bay is now one of the most important places in the world. And the city's on its road to a real recovery. And how long before the citizens of your territory start to say, hey, we, we want to say in how we're governed. We want to say in what you're doing. And we don't like that you make all these decisions for us and you, and you decide all these things for us. But back when we were suffering and no one had food and no one had electricity, those things were nice. But now it's different. And I think that's what what Taylor and the rest of the undersiders are going to be dealing with as the city starts to kind of rebound a little bit. Yeah, like the the curse of prosperity. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so from Regdlas, we have: uh, Is there any character that's irredeemable? Any character whose interlude wouldn't make you feel like their actions are perhaps forgivable? Yeah, I think that depends on like what your definition of like. Re- Redemption is and, and to redeem like if you mean like balancing the cosmic scales of justice then i think no there's no one that that's completely irredeemable um but i also think there's a difference between someone doing an action that makes up for a previous wrong action and forgiving someone for an action they've done like like if jack slash suddenly decides that he's gonna save the world instead of destroy it um i'm gonna be like yay thanks jack um, but you should still probably be punished for all the horrible things that you did. And, and I think like, I think that's one of the things we're exploring with this is that, and Wild Bo continually like proves that even some of the worst people have perspective to their behavior, have a reasoning behind why they're acting the way they, they did. So I wouldn't be surprised if we spend more time with some of the worst characters you've encountered, like, like Bonesaw, Accord, uh, even Idolan, as we learn more and more of how like reckless and kind of corrupted he's been, um, things that will help us understand them better. But, but so I, I, I don't think I don't want to fully say that no one is irredeemable. But I think there's a big difference between redemption and and forgiveness. Yeah, um, it, I mean, I think it's really interesting because we there are actually several distinct elements in this story that that you know could be considered like extenuating like okay you've got you've got this element of the passengers making people behave worse than they otherwise would you've you've got you know creatures and or people in this world who exert either like manipulation of causality or like explicit mind control um uh you know or or, you know like heartbreaker is basically what i'm thinking about um yeah so so like the, the actions themselves aren't aren't forgivable as actions, um, but the but the but, but you may come to understand some of these characters in a completely different light depending on, you know, once you learn why exactly the way why they behave the way they behave, and we've we've right. seen some examples of that already. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, this is I think an interesting question. I, I don't think you know we can give a whole lot of examples, but but the question is how would you use some villain powers as a hero? Uh, within the PRT regulations, like examples being like Skitter, Sundance, or Ballistic, um, basically just like the, the more the more terrifying kind of like no obvious way to use it in a peaceful fashion powers. Yeah, one of the other ones he gives is is Bone Saw, um, mm-hmm. and a good Bone Saw would be like super useful. Um, yeah, because as long as the changes that she's making to people's body were done with the consent of the people, 
she could make capes really difficult to kill um and, and she could help like fix people that have been really hurt um she'd be like super useful that'd be a huge advantage um sundrancer and ballistic are a little tougher um i think like like ballistic's super useful in a fight where the person you're fighting against like can take a hit like that throwing yeah. a car at them at really fast speeds will not kill them instantly um so but not as useful in the kind of cops and robbers-esque fights that we saw early in the book sundancer we've seen her used defensively we've seen her like use her son as um like a like a barrier a shield to prevent someone from going somewhere or getting out of somewhere um so i think i think there's ways that these kind of super like damaging powers can work within these codes it's just it just their contribution can't be as direct and like and in the thick of it as some of the other powers yeah it just occurred to me ballistic could carry around like rubber bullets or something equivalent you know like r- rubber balls or something where it would still be really painful and debilitating to be hit by the projectile but not lethal and yeah that's that's kind of what miss militia does because if you think about it miss militia has a extremely lethal power that she is you know continually having to nerf yeah that's true yeah um okay it's a good question though. yeah so next question is alejandro uh, via email uh, and the question is, what do you make of Lisa telling Taylor? And eventually I found you. I took one look at you and I had a grasp of what was going on. It didn't take too long for me to notice that you had the same air around you that Rex did. Um, and, and the question is, the specific question is, do you think Taylor was subconsciously suicidal at the beginning of the story? Would that be a reason why she went in, alone into ABB territory on her first night in costume and jumped into a fight with Lung at the first chance? Yeah, so we actually got this 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 is a question we that was asked from many people um kind of from a different direction but um does does what we learned mean that taylor was suicidal when lisa met her why did lisa seemingly not um treat others the same way that she saw that treated taylor other people that were going through difficult situations like amy um honestly i'm not totally sure i i I will say that i don't think taylor was suicidal when Lisa met her. I don't think she was there. I think, I think she was in a very rough place and maybe she could be there, be at a place where she's suicidal sometime down the road that, that, that if things hadn't changed in her life, it could lead to that moment. But I don't think that this is specifically saying that we should draw a connection between those two things and that, that Taylor at arc one was a suicidal person. I I do not think so. Um, I don't know if you agree with that or not. Yeah, I don't I don't think we have any evidence that she was from within her own point of view. I'm, I I would say that that based on what we know about master triggers specifically from from that graduate student, um, it, it seems likely that anyone who is, you know, capable of having a master trigger is probably somewhere in, in the neighborhood of of being, uh, you know, depressed, mm-hmm. uh, quite depressed, probably. Um, and, and, you know, a, uh, what, what's the word a, 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 at risk for, for becoming suicidal. But, yeah. um, but, but if anything, I feel like maybe Taylor was, uh, her, you know, triggering may have actually given her a bit of a, of a push to, to, to keep going, even if it was a push that pushed her into a place of, of more yeah. conflict. See, that's my interpretation because the Taylor that w- goes out to fight lung, that first night is not a tailor that says, I hope I die. That was a mm-hmm. tailor that says, I have finally found purpose and I am ready to be a hero. And of course that, that goes in a place that she never expected it, but she gets into that fight because I am going to be a hero and I'm going to do the right thing. And there are kids in danger and I'm going to stop this guy. So yeah. that doesn't strike me as a person that's, that's suicidal in that moment. Not saying that, that she, again, that she could not get there someday. I think yeah. I think if she had continued to travel down a certain road, then then, yes, she could possibly get there. But that's not what I saw in that moment. Yeah. Um, as far as like the Amy thing, like Lisa is very cruel to Amy at first, even though Amy is kind of in a similar situation as Taylor. I mean, I think part of that is just Lisa met Taylor first and um, became fully occupied with uh, being with helping Taylor and 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 propping up taylor and and lisa and uh, amy in this moment was a threat to taylor a threat to the health of taylor 
and therefore Lisa struck out against her. And you pointed out something when we were talking about this earlier that uh, Lisa, once Amy is no longer a threat, invites Amy to become an undersider, that she tries to take her under her wing. And, and this could be her reacting in a very similar way that she did to Taylor, that she sees something in her and now and that she's no longer a threat to her people. Let's bring her in and let's help her in a similar way we did we did for Taylor. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think uh, she, she saw Amy as her enemy in that first moment. And, and then when she kind of saw her objectively, it was different. Yeah, yeah. Um, from, from the Reddit, we have several people asking, um, specifically, um, so I'm having some problems with my application, just a lackey asking, Scott, why do you hate shipping? <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm going to jump in with my answer first, okay. <laughs> which is my serious answer is like most of what we're trying to do here entails analyzing stories as constructions. So characters, feel real because of clear, clever narrative techniques, but they aren't real people. Um, and, and I'm I'm very interested in understanding why they feel real and in understanding those techniques. And I'm not ever nearly as interested in pretending that they are real and imagining them doing things that they aren't actually doing in the story. Yeah, plus it's like a really annoying word. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. And, you know, shipping as it's traditionally done, usually involves connecting characters together that the text doesn't explicitly do, but fandom says, I like these two characters and I think these two characters would be good together, so I'm going to connect them together, even though nothing in the text supports that read at all. Um, that's And I know there are interpretations of the word that are not that, that there are explicit textual evidence. Like I, Apparently, the, the, this clock blocker Taylor thing is a big ship um, that people have I think that's there's there's textual evidence for that in here. Like it's subtle, but it's there. So I don't think that's shipping in the way that annoys me. Um, I always go back to to Brienne and Tormund from Game of Thrones as one that annoys the shit out of me because, like, no, like there, there's it's a joke. Like one character being obsessed with the other is a funny joke. Like this is not a thing that would ever actually happen, and we need to stop it. Like we just stop it. Right, because um, that's contrary to Brienne's character. Yeah, yeah. She wants to do Jamie. Like, duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She wants pretty boys. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you, you were the one who pointed that out, actually. Yeah. And I don't really hate it so much as um, I just, it's not somewhere that my brain goes. That's... Yeah, and it's just like, I mean, really, really, it's just the word. Like, it, it's like, <laughs> like the, and I think it's just, it's become like, the motivation behind it kind of annoyed me. And then I, as the more I heard the word, like the more it just like nails on a chalkboard for me, like I'd ship that. I'm just like, Ugh, stop it. <laughs> yeah. All right. From sleeper thinker on Reddit. Um, hold on. Sorry. Whoops. That doesn't go there. Or does it help me out? What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, this is his question. Nothing is nothing is wrong. <laughs> um, have you considered having uh, a re recording a live reading of the most wow chapters? Um, this was mentioned a few times. Scott is already live tweeting. Uh, what do you think about doing a recording a live reading with Scott's reaction and then add, adding to the podcast? Um, uh, we're all expecting your reactions to certain things, but having an actual live impression is so much better um, than a description a few days later. So Scott, what do you, uh, what do you say to this? So I don't, I don't think this is as interesting as, as people make it seem when they say stuff like this. I, I, I don't like even the crazy parts of this book that have happened so far. I don't like, I don't make a lot of noise. It's just like, at most it's like, oh shit or something like that. And I just don't think that like editing in just like, it, here's what it would be. It would be silence and then something happens and scott says oh shit or what does that mean and i just i just don't i just don't think that would be very interesting to see or listen to or any of that so i just don't think that's going to be something we're going to do um if you like if you want to see my live reactions to stuff you can see them in text format when i tweet them but i i just don't i don't think it would be as interesting as everyone seems to think it would be yeah, I mean, I know exactly what scenes you guys are talking about, and 
and like just from a logistic point of view, it, it would be like Scott would probably be really, really distracted by the fact that he's either recording or filming himself. And yeah, then his yes. reaction would be like extra self-conscious and probably partly fake, uh, you know, for, for everyone's benefit. And it's like, I, I'm, I'm actually tempted. There's, there's one particular one. You all know what I'm talking about. Um, where, where I was actually tempted to be like, maybe we could try just for that one. And I, I don't think we will for all the reasons that we just explained. Plus, I think, I think you said this before, but if, if we say, okay, chapter 20.5, Scott, we're going to live record your reaction. Then it like builds something like, it's like, I know something's coming, something big. And it kind of like damages my perception of what I'm reading. Like, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just I, I I understand like why you want it. I understand how exciting it is to to see my reactions to stuff because a lot of this podcast is kind of living vicariously through a new reader, it, which is an experience that you you can't get on your own anymore after you've read the book. So I I, I get that. I just I, I don't know. I just don't think it would be as interesting <laughs> as as people seem to think it would. Yeah, I mean, if somebody wants to try to like convince me that we're wrong about this, you can go for it. But I'm, yeah. I'm I think we've made our case here that. It just wouldn't work out the way, you know, the, the way you might imagine. The next question from, um, and this is, yeah, this is, this is from Joe, 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 eight. The eighth. On Reddit. Uh, you guys have mentioned multiple times that Brian is very cautious while Taylor is not. Do you think that the, that might have something uh, to do with the difference between their two careers as capes? with Brian being mainly a small time thief and enforcer for most of his Cape career uh, before the undersiders while Taylor on her first night out fought lung uh, and that fight ended with his capture and her joining the undersiders. Um, so you could even notice the difference in the bank job with Taylor coming up with a plan of attack uh, while, while, while Brian kind of hangs back. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm not sure. Think? So I don't know, like if we're saying the reason Brian's more cautious is because he came up being, um, a small time thief and enforcer. I think it's the opposite. I think the reason why Brian is, came up a small time thief and enforcer is because he's a very cautious person. Um, so that, that's what the thing he was interested in. And I think one of the things that I said a while ago about Brian and Taylor and the differences between them is that while Brian's caution is this great and admirable trait, I think to have sometimes it doesn't work in the type of situations the undersiders keep finding themselves in. It's like, it's like playing a turn-based strategy game while everyone you're fighting against is playing a real-time strategy game. It, it's great in theory to be able to stop your progress and take a long, hard thought about what your next move is going to be, but everyone else <laughs> isn't doing that. So um, I think I think that's a great way to compare these two characters, and I, I don't know if I would say that, that Brian is this way because of that early career. I would say it's the opposite of that. Yeah. I mean, and plus powers uh, uh, brian's power is hiding basically right. that's that's certainly true that that how who and that i mean like the, the, it's a clever thing about worm is that like he got his powers because of his personality so his powers reflect his personality but his yeah. personality reflects his powers like because yeah. of because of the setup of the origin of these things and how they came to be and and how they are the way they are like it it just it's a perfect metaphor for forwards and backwards and yeah. and it works so well. It's very clever, right? And and in and in contrast, Taylor's power and her personality are both take control, basically. Right. right. So. Yep. And then there's a follow up to that question, which is uh, aimed at me. Uh, as as I was rereading with the Lisa origin in mind, were there any specific uh, comments that stuck out of my mind? Uh, one thing. One thing that uh, this user always notes is Lisa's dismissal towards Ulur Girl's trigger event, um, as in like the, this, the fact that she had kind of a less less traumatic trigger event makes her privileged in a certain way, which I think is interesting. Um, and I thought about this for a while. Um, the, the, the main thing that becomes apparent on rereads is, is the fact that Lisa allows Taylor's aggravating behavior to just pass without remark like 100% of the time. There's... There's never like it happens over and over again, and it becomes much more apparent on on rereads that um, that she's Taylor pretty much can't ever ruffle her feathers no matter what she says. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and you definitely called this out as we were going. Um, I, I really liked that you called this out uh, every time it occurred. Um, and that's why, like, there's <laughs> there's people that were like, oh, my God, Scott, I can't believe, like, the prediction you made. Like, that was so crazy how you were able to do that. And, like, I think what a lot of people forget sometimes is that you're, like, the 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 information you're pulling and cultivating for your summaries uh, is helping to focus me and and I'm not saying you're spoiling anything for me but like when when you are specifically pulling out information like look how um, look how ready Lisa is to support Taylor and how Taylor can't do anything wrong in Lisa's mind it it maybe not consciously but it, it it directs me towards a certain line of thinking where I can go yeah that's true maybe that has to do with her trigger event and then and that kind of lets me extrapolate out so like there's people that say like oh my god you're so good at predicting things but like i think you you're part of that like you like you are helping distill down to the most important elements and parts of the story yeah that that's probably happening to some degree i i try really hard to minimize that like like uh there was some specific thing where where like i i i avoided it at all costs any any like comparison or mention of of like Sophia and, and Shadow Soccer's similarities <laughs> in, in terms of like background and behavior and all that like because first of all that one was a fairly early reveal and so it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have like paid but like it, it all comes down to like how much value do you get out of it because you you don't uh, other than just spoiling the reveal for you there's not a lot of value to be had in pointing out like oh Shadow Soccer is athletic um <laughs> Whereas like you, I, I, I think like myself and, and other people appreciate and, and enjoy like noticing like, Oh, Lisa does behave this way consistently. And, um, and it's always in there. And uh, at a certain point it takes an effort to, to avoid seeing it for me at least. But yeah, and I'm not, yeah. I'm not claiming you did anything wrong in that. I'm not claiming you should not have directed like one of the things we're doing here, th this this project is not just about m me experiencing the book for the first time. That is definitely part of it. But this project is also about pointing out things that Wildbow does, characterizations, um, setups that he lays, how he's crafting his story and how he's doing things. So if you were to always intentionally avoid those moments, um, I think we wouldn't, we'd be, we would be doing a disservice to our, our listeners in a, to a certain yeah. extent. So, um, I think that's important. Yeah. And and there are certain things that um, I don't want you to read too much into this, Scott, but there are certain things that I, I will I have pointed I, I have drawn attention to in the summary as a wink for people who have read the books um, that you do not like immediately uh, interpret as, you know, spoiler material. Um, I, I try not to yeah. do that too often because I'm afraid that you will be like, oh, I see what you're getting at. Um, but I try not to do that too much. So, yeah, I mean, and I'm sure that that exists. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think I think we're doing a pretty good job with it. I, I don't think like I, I, I certainly don't think I I'm saying that I got the Lisa thing because of Matt. Matt did this and therefore I got it. I'm just saying that, like, it, it helps to when you we focus down to the most important elements of the story that that gets me thinking within a certain mindset i guess yeah. is, is how i'd say it yeah i think i think that we're doing this uh, about as well as can be expected honestly <laughs> <laughs> all right uh burn victim 42 asks scott once you've finished worm how long do you think it'll be before you want to reread the story as a follow up how long do you think it will take for the parasite that you've been infected by to fully gestate and then compel you to recommend Worm to everyone you know at every opportunity. Yeah, in a perfect world, I'd dive back into the story immediately after finishing it the first time, but my schedule is insane um, with not only this website and these set of podcasts, but my uh, full-time job as well, and then maintaining the semblance of a personal life I have on top of all the books I want to read. My personal life, I have a, a giant stack of books behind me that I want to read. Um, I, I probably will not get around to it for a while, uh, if ever, unfortunately, but I, it's something I want, I, I already want to do, but I just, I don't know when that would happen. 
Um, yeah, well, what I'll say is like what I tend to do is just be like, especially during this project, I'll just be like, oh, man, I really want to reread, you know, uh, Alex interlude or something. And then I'll reread yeah. that or, or, or listen to it on the audiobook, And then I'll be like, oh, th- this is this is cool. What happens next? And then I'll find that I've listened to like four arcs. Um, just cause I, I couldn't stop, you know, <laughs> this has yeah. happened over and over actually. So, um, yeah. yeah, as far as the other question, I've already like started convincing everyone I know, like I have two friends that now are, uh, reading the book and, and following along with the podcast. Um, one of my friend's wife has just started as well. Um, I'm trying to get my wife into it as well. She said she wants to, but she's very busy as well. So she hasn't gotten the time yet. So that's, it's already happening. Like I'm, and it's going to continue to happen. Yeah, right. I mean, if I'm proud of if, if if there's anything I'm proudest of, it's the fact that we have definitely created some warm readers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next question from the same user uh, regarding Taylor's theme of escalation. Do you think that she could ever find a line that she can't rationalize crossing? Do you think anything could ever cause her to de-escalate, or will she always keep a death grip on all of the tools in her neatly compartmentalized toolbox? Uh, the short answer is. No, um, I don't. I, I don't think that there's a line she can't convince herself to cross. Um, I think that as long as she remains, I think her real superpower is her compartmentalization, her ability to justify things. So, so as long as she has the ability to find that justification, I don't think there's a line that she she would not cross. Um, that's not to say that she can't change. And and I, what could cause her to de-escalate? I honestly, the only thing I, thing I can think of is. If, she stops being able to find that justification because she, she does not act recklessly. I mean, she, she acts suddenly, but she always has purpose behind it. She always has a justification behind it. So uh, the only thing that would stop her is, um, do I have something to justify? Do I have something I can use? Do I have an excuse for this behavior? Mm -hmm. And as long as she has that, I think there's really no limit to what she would do. Okay. Um, next question, uh, Taylor has mentioned that everyone could use some therapy. Do you think that she would act on this if she was put in the room with Jessica Yamada? Uh, or do you think that her general distrust of others would prevent her from ever following through with this idea? Yeah. You know, as much as I'd love to see Jessica and Taylor sit down for a nice long chat, I do not think Taylor would be very perceptive to it, at least at first. Um, her, her distrust of authority figures in general would kind of automatically put her on the defensive in this conversation and, and either reject or fight back against anything that Yamada would throw forth. I think that a skilled therapist could eventually get through to her, um, but it would take a long time and I don't know if, uh, the, the the opportunity would be there like we are we we know yamada like talks about the cycling of therapists like th- that they don't keep the same one on each each person at least with the ward so i don't know the opportunity would be there to put in the time that would take for for jessica's therapy to, to get through to her mm-hmm. okay uh next question um which i think is 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 interesting uh w- Given what we know of the Worm Reverse so far, what type of protagonist would you like to see in Worm Two? Would um, would you like to see a character more like uh, like like m- more more like Taylor or, or some other cape, um, or an, or even a non parahuman protagonist to provide a fresh pers- perspective on this on this world? Um, m- my thought is probably not a non cape, uh, just and that's just because I enjoy Wildbow's um like like use of of powers too much um but beyond that i i almost like one of the things i'm looking forward to about worm 2 is like i I know it's going to be different and i'm just curious as to how so really almost anything i'm sure is going to be delightful to me yeah yeah i i I almost kind of think it has to be someone with powers because i do enjoy those non-cape point of views when we get them but in the long arc of an entire novel, I don't think a person without powers would have enough active agency in the conflicts that are going on uh, to find them engaging for that long. Um, unless it's just like a completely different kind of novel, like it's it's not even playing in the same genre, really, uh, of writing, then maybe that would work. Um, I-, I hope it's not just Taylor again. I don't know if he said or not. Um, I-, I obviously don't know how the book ends either, but um, I... I, I I do think that, that Wild Bill kind of has a struggle ahead of him, though, because 
Taylor's power and her type of personality allow her to be this character that has the ability to to like survey the battlefield and, and see everything and be able to comment on it, which helps us, the readers, by giving us a clear picture of what's going on at all times. So how do you create another character uh, who feels different enough from Taylor without losing that ability to kind of explain to us what's going on in the battle and, and that kind of uh, that kind of administrator or uh, or like surveyor of of the battlefield, you know, so I don't know. That's going to be tough. I'm really interested to see what he comes up with. Yeah, I'm having to bite back twig spoilers here. But, uh... <laughs> I guess that's fair. Yeah, he's got all these other things that I haven't even read yet, so. Yeah, um, I, I, suffice to say that I have faith that he'll figure it out. I do too. I, I'm not yeah. worried about that at all. I just think it's it's an interesting challenge um, that you're returning to a place that you've always told from this certain point of view, and now uh, you want to do it similarly to make the people that have read the book happy, but you also want to make it different enough to where it doesn't feel like you're just reading the same thing over again. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And this this last question, still from the same user. Um, which I think is is very interesting. Uh, what is uh, what has been the most surprising thing that you've run into since starting the We've Got Worm podcast? Um, and then, uh, do you think you'll ever impose a limit on podcast length? Um, the, the, and, and they and the, they remarked that they they're afraid that some episodes that that run too long might end up uh missing some things that we would otherwise want to comment on we, we've um, imposed limits on podcast length all the time we just break <laughs> them every time yeah yeah i think sometimes we give the impression that we're like skipping over material that we wanted to cover that actually never happens nope. like, like if 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 we if we leave something out it's usually because we either didn't notice it or it just kind of slipped our mind while we were doing our our, our notes um, that actually happened last week where there were a couple of beats that I, I really like, we really should have talked about that we, that we, um, that we just kind of neglected. Like, like I wanted to mention now, like, um, we, we kind of didn't reflect on the fact that, that Sundancer had this, this arc of, um, you know, starting out and, and really being, being against violence and ultimately being convinced to kill her friend for, um, you know, for, for the chance to get home and, and how tragic that is. I mean, we, we remarked on it, but I, I had been thinking like ever since the first time Sundancer was introduced, like I've been thinking about this exact scene where she has to, has to put Noel out of her, out of her misery and thinking like, I can't wait to get there because we get to wrap all of this up and we just kind of <laughs> glazed over it actually. So. Yeah. And I would say that happens to me just about every week. As, as much as we cover, there's always things that I'm kicking myself for. Cause like, Either on my first read through, I made just a mental note or on my second read through, I thought of something but didn't write it down or got distracted or something else happened. And and it just I, I listen to the podcast as I'm editing and I'm like, shit, we forgot to talk about this. And it it happens. It's unfortunate, um, but it does happen. And that's yeah. why I like when you guys call us out, like the comment on the, the, the Emma uh, Lisa comparison like that. That was great. Like if we miss stuff, you know, call us out. Absolutely. Yeah. There was another another Emma related one, and I know we're we're getting off of the question, but I think it's important because uh, it was actually Wildbo that drew my attention to this. That in in one of Taylor's first descriptions of, of Emma, in like arc four, she she draws attention to Emma's hair and how Emma can always like make any style look good, and 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 how her her hair is is so great. Um, and and we have this moment in in the traumatizing Emma chapter where uh where her hair gets cut and then she she ends up like trying to let it grow out and basically just do anything she can to um to erase the the impact of of the traumatic event on her yeah and and then like the first thing Taylor says when she sees her is um is like oh your your hair looks great you can you know and and uh and Emma like before Taylor said that and uh Emma was thinking about maybe not being horrible. And then after Taylor says that she kind of shuts down and, and pushes her away. Um, yeah. so there's it's this interesting through line on that particular, um, motif, which yeah. I, I, I adore. Yeah. And that goes back to, to Julio's, um, communication theme is that, you know, you, you say things and you mean them in a certain way, but they are interpreted completely different and they have an impact that you never thought of because how could you know, because you're not communicating. People aren't saying, what actually has happened to them, what they're actually feeling. 
yeah that yeah. was that was really great i'm glad he he pointed that out yeah um so to back get back to the, to the question the, yeah. yeah back to the question <laughs> um so the, the first part of the question was what is the most surprising thing um that you that you've that you've discovered and and i i think the the most dis- surprising thing to me um has been that I'm, I'm beginning to understand why I love this story so much because I already knew that I loved it and, and I had a sense of why, but when I thought about it, I, I would always focus more on like the types of narrative techniques that were employed and how well, uh, how, how well they were employed. Like the, you know, things, things that we tend to talk about, like, like the management of tension, the, the setting up of threats ahead of time and foreshadowing, the strongly established characters and, and their arcs and, and, and I would focus less on stuff like, like themes. Um, and, um, it, it, it turns out that, that what really kind of drove my underlying appreciation for, for this was probably, it probably had a lot more to do with the thematic coherence of the work and, and how, how consistently those themes are, are driven home through the characters. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say the most surprising thing for me is uh, the, the the sheer quality of the writing. And and I'll readily admit that I was one of those guys that tended to write off self-published web fiction as not serious writing. And a- after I finished the first arc, I was like, hey, this, this is pretty good. And it, it's only gotten better from here. But it, it, it's specifically like the way in which it's good that is most surprising to me. Like it's, this isn't just a fun book filled with cool moments and action packed scenes. It's, it's, it's a novel that's thematically rich, well-written thought provoking. It's literature. It really is. And it, it is, it is the perfect example of, of what I love most about what genre fiction can be and what it can do. And, and and it can take these weird alien concepts, uh, otherworldly concept as like a window into telling this rich, complex story about people and the things that people go through. Um, and I was not expecting that. I really wasn't. I, I should have because I know you, Matt, and I know what you like. But um, I was expecting just like a superhero fun story. And that's that's not what I've gotten. Yeah, no, I know what you mean there. And I guess the popularity of the podcast is surprising to me continuously. Um, yeah, like it's amazing. I it's incredible. Yeah, and I guess just to, to add to that, like how awesome the fans are. Um, we, we were just talking. Yeah, and, and, and I don't want to jinx this, but we were just talking about how like I'm I'm sh- absolutely shocked that we haven't had just like dive bombing runs of of assholes trying to spoil y- you on on like plot details. Um, this just it it has i don't know i don't know if it's n- never happened but it's it's practically never happened um and that just speaks to like the the kind of people who are who become fans of this i guess it kind of attracts a a good hearted kind of person yeah maybe. yeah i i remember like when we announced that we were going to do the twitter live reading thing and and there were some people that had some i think legitimate concerns with oh my god someone's going to tweet you a big spoiler um that's never happened like there's never been a, a Snape kills Dumbledore moment that, that we've had. Um, Spoiler. Oh, come on. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, that that's never happened to me. Like that. No one has ever done that. No one has ever set out to uh, d- destroy this book for me. And we we got an email today on the We've Got Worm thread that uh, was about the ending. But the person in the email wrote in the email subject, spoiler, the ending. So I was just like not going to click on that one. <laughs> and I just told you about it and you looked at it. And I think it, it is, it's miraculous that, that people have tried to maintain what we're doing throughout this. And I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Definitely. Um, okay, Scott, uh, how far are we into the bag? About uh, 4%. Great. Let's take a break and check out our interview with rain. All right. Hey everybody. This is uh, this is a segment we're very excited about. Uh, on the line here, we've got uh, Rain, who who is, I suppose, responsible for the Worm audiobook podcast. Um, you know, and, and and I don't even know uh, what that means exactly. So hopefully, <laughs> we're going to get into that in the course of this in the course of this discussion. Um, how are you doing, Rain? I'm doing all right. Glad to be here. Cool. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I, I guess the the most like. The, the the question that comes into my mind um, is 
like first of all is it safe to assume that worm is is kind of an important story to you uh yeah yeah it's <laughs> definitely uh like and 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 so the question is like and and hopefully you can answer this without without spoilers um mm-hmm. but like what is what does it mean to you and i ask that cuz the story means a lot to me and that's why i'm doing this podcast so i i assume if you're another person who's put a ton of effort into this it it's got to be you know important to you for some reason yeah, so it doesn't have a uh, like a super like deep and and personal meaning to me. Um like I know it does for a lot of people. It's just it it kind of scratches an itch, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. uh like I've always enjoyed superhero stories, but they're all always well, superhero stories. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, there's some that go on the like grim dark side and that's a little bit too much. Um but Worm did it in such a way that it was realistic and um just very very well developed like ev- the the characters in the worlds uh, or rather sorry the, the characters in the world um are all extremely uh you know well developed especially like every side character has is is well fleshed out um and it's something like world building has always been a big thing for me in like anything I consume, any type of entertainment media. Yeah, I definitely feel you on on, on all of those things. Um, you know, it's it, it's hard to it's it's hard for me to to encapsulate. You know, it wasn't until I started doing this podcast that I was really able to succinctly explain like these are the these are the the reasons why you should read Worm. But uh, but <laughs> like you said, it's like look, it's just it's just really really well done. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, we're a million words into the book, and and I don't think I could explain. <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so what specifically led to you deciding to undertake such a massive project? <laughs> so um, you could probably actually dig into my uh, Reddit history to find it, but there is uh, I was on the Parahuman subreddit, and I believe how it got there. Somebody was talking about. Um, how like there should be an audio book or something. And I was saying like, oh, you know, that sounds like a great idea. And at the time, so I had, you know, already finished Worm a while ago. And uh, I was trying to get my uh, then fiance, now wife to read it. But, you know, she was very busy and and didn't really have time to sit down and read things. Um, but, but I knew that she, you know, listened to audio books a lot. So I was like, hey, you know, this would be a great thing. Like, why has nobody done this? And uh, um, you know, p- people said like, oh yeah, you know, that'd be awesome. And then uh, I remember Snagger, who was the other person who uh, contributed to this originally with me, said that he had recorded, like, he was basically in exactly the same situation, um, and he had recorded just very casually him reading the first arc. Um, for his girlfriend and I was like okay cool and I'd, I'd always had kind of a an interest in voice work but never really d- done anything um and I was like hey you know what let's make this happen so you know I, I set up the the whole website I devised the plan for having uh people alternate every arc so that we could maintain a schedule and I knew that with the you know ridiculous number of chapters in worm that i'd have to have an actual set schedule that we did on a you know pretty regular basis otherwise people would lose interest um and that i would have to uh you know absolutely stick to and with the amount of content that would have been nearly impossible for one or even two people to do yeah, it's it's like it's almost 300 individual chapters, right? Yeah, 304, I believe. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. What, it, it, go ahead, Scott. Was there ever like a point where you were just like, there's no way we're going to finish this thing? Like, <laughs> this is just is so much like it because I mean, it's hours upon hours upon hours of work. I can't I can't imagine. Yeah, the the workload was intense, but I became um just kind of like really personally invested in it, uh, in, in seeing it through to its completion. Um, just cause I don't like giving up on things. And I knew that it was something that people would enjoy and it would, 
it would open it up for a lot of people who either weren't physically able to or otherwise unable to, you know, read Worm, um, which I actually got a couple of emails from a couple of blind people who were thanking me for doing it, which was a like huge, huge uh, thing for me. Yeah. And That's yeah, awesome. it, yeah, like it, it gave me a huge motivation boost, especially at a time when uh, there was a lot of like difficulties uh, getting like chapters ready on time. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of, you know, it, it became doing it for them. Yes. Um, so, so speaking of, of, of difficulties in general, like what was the biggest hurdle that you faced in this project? It's hard to say which was the biggest because there were a lot. <laughs> um, I'd say the initial hurdle was finding other people to contribute. Um, the, uh, I, I'd had it planned that the interlude chapters would all be our like vetting chapters for arc readers and also for like guest readers or people who just simply didn't want to commit to doing, uh, you know, full arcs and it pretty much ended up doing that. But there are, I forget the count, I believe it's 70 interlude chapters, um, and that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. uh and I didn't know anybody who could do those things. So I started off just uh posting on boards like uh uh Reddit's uh you know voice acting, um voice work and record this. And I got a number of people from there, but initially when I like just needed people now uh, I actually just reached out to the people closest to me. My the the first interlude was my sister's ex or now ex husband. Um, and actually throughout when I needed people to cover it before I had the connections to to reach out, um, it's basically people that I could physically get my hands on. That that's really interesting because like when I was thinking about how to approach asking you about this, I was like I don't. I don't really know whether th the difficulties would be more like project management or like technology. And it sounds like from what you're saying, they're a lot more on, on the project ma management and the personnel side. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. What was, I guess, like if you could talk about like your vetting process for those people that I mean, you, you mentioned at the interludes, would you just have them record a section and send it to you? And then if it was good enough you went forward or, or how did that work? Um, generally, yeah, I would, uh, ask people initially, I would ask people to, um, you know, choose an interlude chapter that they were interested in doing from the list of upcoming ones that, you know, I needed people for. And if they were, you know, th then they would send me a, a snippet and I'd either give them pointers or, you know, it'd generally be, you know, good enough. And unfortunately I had to make a lot of, uh, uh, sacrifices on the good enough side when, for example, I would have people who were committed to doing a chapter and then not contacting me, not getting back to me and not responding to emails in any way for weeks at a time. And then either like showing up at the last second and dropping the chapter in my lap or right after I'd gotten somebody else to do it or, um, you know, saying like three days beforehand, oh yeah, I'm working on it. It's going to be done. And then nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, my, you know, we, we never missed a, a chapter day in the almost two years that it ran. So, wow. you know, there was, there was some occasions where I'd just like cancel my plans for the night and be like, okay, I guess I'm recording this interlude. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I guess that makes sense when you're doing something that's basically in it at volunteer basis, you're kind of just at, at the whim of other people. Um, yeah. you're obviously the, the one you're running this, so you're the most committed, but you've got mm -hmm. to rely on all these other people being just as committed as you are. And you're not, yeah. you're just not always going to get that. So that's uh, the, the fact that you were able to never miss a deadline is, is kind of ridiculous. Almost. It's very commendable. Yeah. I, I had, uh, for almost the entire length of the project, I would get probably a dozen people 
uh, emailing me per week without me seeking them out, uh, saying they were interested. And of those dozen, I would like I would my, my opener would always be great. I just need two things from you: create an account on the website so that I can get your info, and and also give you access to the like how to contribute page and all that. Um, and you know, pick a chapter that you're interested in doing. Bonus points if you want to send me the clip in advance. Um, of those 12 people, maybe half would respond to that. <laughs> um, so then of those half, uh, maybe half of those would actually claim a chapter. Um, and then of those, maybe half would actually communicate with me up to releasing a chapter and then of those maybe half would actually send me the chapter yeah so how how far i guess like in advance did you have this planned out like was your like were you running kind of tr or at least trying to have a, a a backlog of things that you can drop so you're not coming right to the wire like were you making these plans like weeks in advance Oh, I was making plans uh, months in advance wow. when possible. Um, interludes were always the most difficult to plan. Um, arcs, once I got people to that were generally committed, um, were easy to plan out because it was simply, all right, you know, here's the schedule. Here's when that arc airs. Get me the chapters before then. And at that point, it would be like a couple months. Um, so because at one point we had... Hmm, five i believe uh people all doing uh, arcs together so you know each each arc would take including the interludes close to a month maybe a little more maybe a little less uh to air so you know that's five months out do you know off the top of your head how many individuals participated in this total oh boy well so if you include all of the uh the full cast chapters, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, I had it written down at one point. I included it in the final outro of the final chapter. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like I actually wrote it on the website at all. It's okay. Maybe we can uh, edit that number in here or something. But yeah, it, it's it, it's got to be it's got to be in the in the tens you know it, oh easily um, it, it's in the uh it was more than 50 okay wow yeah i mean that i i can i can tell that much just from having listened to it and uh and, and i'm sure there were more behind the scenes maybe um yeah so so in terms of um so, so people would individually record it and then they would send it to you and then i suppose mm -hmm. you would be the one who who edited it all together um no, no, unless okay. unless they absolutely needed me to, um, which I did on a number of occasions, uh, I would ha ask them to edit it first. Okay. Um, and then I would typically, uh, unless they got it to me at the very last second, which unfortunately happened more often than not, uh, I would typically go through and then give it a, a second pass myself. Um, um. But again, when they send me the chapter at 1155 and it airs at 12, <laughs> there's not yeah. much I can do. <laughs> um, but that's part of why I'm going through and very, very slowly uh, doing the uh, the full compilation and giving every chapter an edit pass. You, so you're doing that now? Yeah, I've been doing it for the past year and a half. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, so, so does that mean you, you go through and you like edit the episodes in place? Um, or, or are um, you going to re release like a version two at some point? Yeah, it's going to be a version two. Um, I, I could, I'd have to react. So the, the reason it takes so long is because, um, every step, like every edit step for each file, uh, basically prevents me from doing anything else on my computer for three to four minutes, mm -hmm. which is, too long to just sit there and stare at it. Yeah, I know that. And too yeah. short to get up and do anything else. Yeah, um, Scott's the one who does the editing, so yeah. I was hoping he, I was hoping he could ask some some specific questions that I might not uh, mm -hmm. be able to think of. But uh, 
Yeah, what I guess what what program do you use? Um, Audacity. Okay, yeah, me too. Yeah. It's free yeah, and I it tried. works. <laughs> exactly. Yes, um, and it's actually what uh, what I've learned most people use, um, specifically for uh, long form narration. Yeah. Um, I looked into or I tried out uh, uh, was it Adobe Audition at one point, uh, but the lack of ability to do punch and roll was basically a non-starter um and so to get a little on a little bit more of a technical side uh punch and roll is a technique that i learned from some professional relatively early on uh where so originally i would record make a mistake keep rolling jump back to the nearest starting point and record again and then i would go through and you know listen and pick the best takes and edit them all together. Um, that was extremely time consuming, especially for long form narration. Yeah, I can imagine. So punch and roll is basically you make a mistake, you stop, you scroll back to the nearest starting point and you delete everything after that. And then you scroll back a little farther and hit record so you can listen to the part leading up to where you just started deleting and you can immediately pick up and start recording again. It's um, kinda... And that way there's, the, yeah, that, that way the, there's no like having to deal with outtakes and there's just some timing issues you have to, to fix on your second pass. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to me that, that uh, Adobe wouldn't have that. Yeah, it's, it seems to be more for um, like short form and musical recording. It's got a lot of stuff for, for musical editing yeah. in it. Yeah, but even, I mean, back in the day, I, I used to do a lot of musical recording and, and editing, and, and I did it in Audacity, and, and I I didn't know it was called punch and roll, but I definitely relied on kind of that technique. So, I'm, yeah, yeah, it's, it seems pretty indispensable. Oh, absolutely. My uh, my original editing, so the first couple arcs I did uh, were about a 10 to 1 uh, edit to output ratio, so like mm. 10 minutes for one minute of output. Um, which at the beginning wasn't too bad. It was a couple hours per chapter. Uh, and then the chapters start getting substantially longer and that was not sustainable. Um, so punch and roll brought that down to about like three or four to one. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that, that, I admit that's surprising, and, and Scott's probably glaring at me because he re- <laughs> he's, he's he's realizing that I that I take all of his work for granted. But yeah. um, well, I, I, would, I don't think I, people realize how much effort that takes. Yeah, and, oh, and yeah, you know, the editing we do for this podcast is relatively simple because we're not we're not really cutting out too much. It's just kind of a free flowing conversation. So my editing is easy compared to that. So um, that's wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, again with narration, it's hard because you have to deal with the the timing between like statements and and yeah, yeah. Uh, make sure everything flows together well, uh, and yeah, it it can get very very time consuming. It's the, it's pretty much an endless uh, pit if you want it to be. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so I we... learned pretty early on to uh, start forgiving minor mistakes like. I, I would originally like correct mouth clicks and such, which was just ridiculous. Um, so I learned to just, you know, accept that those happen and that when people listen to it, they're not going to notice. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, that's one of the biggest things that I've learned through podcasting is how little everyone else notices the things that drive you crazy while editing. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. it's like, it's, absolutely. I, I'll sit there and I'll listen and uh, I want to take this out. I want to up the gain on this part just a little bit and then yep. no no one notices no one no one yeah. notices yeah when people start pointing out our vocal tics i tend to i tend to uh, pay attention <laughs> to that but uh, beyond that i think it yeah it doesn't really matter people like so, pointing out our our sayings more than our tics oh sure we apparently yeah, yeah. say the same things over and over again <laughs> and don't even realize we're doing it yeah oh i mean and it happens a lot in worm too yeah that's 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 true yeah um so yeah speaking of of you know, the difficulty of editing, um, and also, I guess the difficulty of, of project management, mm-hmm. um, Scott at least has gotten up through the, the Yamada, uh, full cast interlude and, and that's just extremely impressive. So uh, could you maybe elaborate on that specific, 
um, venture. Yeah, I guess yes. when, when did you decide that we're going to do this? We're going <laughs> to try to try to hit this one out of the park. Yeah, so I'd always wanted to do one, but I knew that it's the the time investment for it would have just been ridiculous. And also, um, for most normal chapters, you wouldn't actually get a whole lot out of other people being a part of it. Uh, like other characters having lines, it, it's heavier in some and lighter in others, but uh, generally the chapters are very narration heavy and not very dialogue heavy. Um, so having a full cast for just general, you know, arc chapters, uh, I felt would have been a little bit of a, a waste of the large amount of effort required to do so. So I wanted to find chapters that were does like w- would fit the format well, that had a lot of different people in them, um, and really focused on, you know, those people being a part of it. And the the um, Yamada interlude is a a p- perfect example of that. You have one character who does the general narration and is pretty much just causing the other characters to talk as much as possible. And uh, yeah, it, it was a great uh, opportunity to do that. So <clears throat> I started planning that one, or rather, I started working on that one probably a few months before it aired. Um, just for that one specific chapter, because I wanted to make sure I had, you know, those lines and everything well in advance, um, because I knew on um, you know editing it was going to be pretty rough, uh, which it was, but it really came out well. I'm very happy with it. Yeah, I I loved it. It was it was fantastic. Like it, yeah. uh, the chapter is great already, and that just like I, I instead of reading it again on my second read through where I take notes, I just listened. And yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it ramps everything up. It really does um, yeah. to a level that just, just the, the normal quality of the audiobook, which, which I quite enjoy as well is great. But yeah, this takes it to, to definitely a new level. So, so in, in this case, yet again, you had a lot of different people from presumably all over the world sending you in their, their, their bits, and then you stitched it together into something that, that flowed. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's amazing to me because like when you're listening to it, especially like the, the conversation bits, it sounds like a conversation, like your brain just parses it as like these people are in the room, right? This is, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's really cool that that works. Yeah. It's definitely props to, you know, all the people who contributed to it. It's, they did a great job. Um, and especially, uh, Kaylin who did the, who did, uh, you know, Jessica Yamada, uh, she's actually a, uh, you know, theater person that I know personally. Um, and I like, I know her voice and I was like, oh, she would be like the, her, her, you know, vocal mannerisms and everything just would be perfect for this character. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. So, um, so a bit of a, a, a tangent from, from, from the podcast specifically, but I was just wondering like what other, um, what other books you like? And, and specifically, this is a question that I, I borrowed from uh, the Tim Ferriss podcast, but, but what, <laughs> what is the book that you've gifted most frequently? Um, other than worm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Aside from that, um, because that would definitely be my answer. Uh, I would say, so I don't gift a lot of books also because, well, partially because I really myself only listen to audiobooks these days. Uh, okay. I, I used to love to sit down and read, but uh, I've just found that, you know, as I've gotten older, it's harder to, you know, get the the time value relationship out of reading when there's yeah. so many other things to do. Yeah, I find um, it to be similar. That's why I've kind of gotten into podcasts as much as I have, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, on my commute, there's nothing else to do except for stare at the car in front of me. So you might as well be listening to a book yeah. or a podcast or, yeah. Um, but... So aside from Worm, I would say House of Leaves would be my most gifted uh, book. Okay. That's sitting on the shelf right next to me, waiting to yes. be read. I, I, I bought it with the intent of reading it, and it's on my to-be-read list and just haven't gotten a chance to do it yet. It is very, very good. Uh, very, very different. Cool. 
yeah, no, I, I know I've seen that on on the top of all kinds of lists. So yeah, uh, that just got bumped up in priority. <laughs> oh yeah, you you know a book is interesting when sometimes the footer goes on for pages. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So so uh, so what's next? Um, so I definitely want to be. Uh, you know, I definitely want to do Worm Two when it comes out. I'm still trying to decide on how I want to do that. Uh, either do it slowly, uh, like just purely myself with guest readers for interludes, um, just to get a consistent feel throughout, uh, or if I want to do the same system I did before, but without the you know rapid chapter release schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, yeah, a bit unsure at the moment. Also, uh, I'm hoping he doesn't start it anytime soon because <laughs> I am, uh, uh, a very busy right now. And, and, uh, that's because I'm, uh, I, I'm actually working on a, a making a game with a couple other, uh, ex coworkers of mine. Oh, uh, awesome. that's awesome. Yeah. We've been working on it since February and Hopefully having it done by um, actually this coming February. Do you want to do you want to plug that at all? <laughs> um, sure. It's actually uh, we went through a fairly major design revision a couple months ago because we realized after a bunch of uh, play testing uh, at a local event that uh, we had something very fun that a lot of people really enjoyed, but we were very limited arbitrarily by things that were we were basically imposing upon ourselves um, because we had this like ideal in mind that was not really actually going to be fun. <laughs> uh, so it's, we, we've finished the, the major like design shift and production has, uh, you know, resumed. Um, but we're back basically where we were in about May um, so the, the name of the game might even change, uh, <laughs> but it is tentatively named Rob Them Blind, and it is a, uh, couch based, but also online, uh, uh, multiplayer, uh, brawler of sorts. Uh, if you can kind of imagine a mixture between, um, Monaco and Super Smash Brothers. Uh, interesting. Yes, that's basically what we're going for. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, Scott, you you used to Scott and I have known each other forever, so so I'm allowed to say that you used to want to be a game designer, right, Scott? Yeah, a, a million years ago. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. I actually, uh, I in the middle of uh, uh, doing the audiobook, I uh, moved across the country so that I could start working at a AAA uh, game studio. Um, which was Turn 10 Studios. It's about to release Forza 7, which I worked on. Oh, nice. Awesome. Um, yeah. Um, but that was also only a contract job, and you know they, they weren't hiring full-time employees afterwards. So now I'm back to consulting. Uh, but yeah, I definitely love game development. Um, if anybody's interested in following the dev blog, it is at dropstar.games. Awesome. And we will definitely put that in our show notes uh, for this episode yes. as well. Yeah. Um, so, so something occurred to me, you, you were talking about, um, doing worm two, And I was, I was thinking like, I, I was, I was kind of going in circles in my head. Cause I was like, well, I bet the fan base is bigger now than it was oh, yeah. um, when you were, when you were doing this or, or if it's, or if it's not bigger at this exact moment, it might sort of like swell again when worm two starts, because even though twig is really good, I think there's a lot of worm readers who are not reading it who might come back for worm too. Um, and then anyway, long story short, what I'm trying to say is I, I bet you would have an easier time finding volunteers now than, than maybe you did when you started the project. Is that, is that right at all? You think? Oh yeah. I think that would, uh, definitely be reasonable. Um, because I know, I know just from, you know, being on the, the subreddit for, God, I don't know, a few years now, I guess, maybe four, four or so, mm -hmm. um, that it's uh, definitely, you know, the the popularity 
has increased substantially. There's a lot more, even if a lot of people aren't uh, active on the subreddit all the time, the people who have read Worm, you know, th that rate increases daily. Yeah. And I might say that there's something like a core fan base mm -hmm. that, that grows, you know, v more, more gradually than the total number of users um, or the total number of readers. But, but that number has definitely been growing gradually. And, and that's, if anything, that's the, that's the base of people who are probably the ones who you would, you know, ultimately rely on to, to contribute their time and energy to a project like that. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's cool. That, that um, makes me excited. Yeah. Plus there's definitely a number of people I would reach out to, um, who I'd worked with in the past for the, the worm audiobook um, that I would love to be working with again. Um, and yeah, some occasionally you don't even have to reach out to people. I got a uh, one guy, the the person who actually did uh, Gru's interlude, um, just emailed me out of nowhere and said, "Hey, here it is." <laughs> oh wow! And I was like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll take that." Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I actually remember that one being really good too. Yeah, um, I believe. Let me see. I think that was Crispy, who went on to do a lot of things with us. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't have any more specific questions. Scott, did you have anything you wanted to ask? I'm just curious. Um, you know, there's there's I, I obviously haven't read the book yet, but there's looks like an audio book that started for Twig, like that basically was inspired by your idea and said, we want to do this, too. Um, it, you've kind of, I guess, paved a road for people. So if there are people sitting out there thinking, I want to do this as well, I want to record an audio book for something that I love. What what advice would you have for them? Uh, at the beginning? Um, first, well, I was going to say first, get a better mic. <laughs> uh, I started using a $8 just garbage microphone that I'd gotten on Newegg New Egg many years ago, um, which is very evident when you listen to ARC 2. Uh, the quality is just garbage. Um, and... Uh, you know, a, a solid mic is not very expensive. I use the the blue Yeti. Um, I used the blue Snowball for about the first half of uh, the audiobook production. Mm -hmm. um, but that uh, the hardware pass through on the Yeti is wonderful. It is a like game changer uh, for especially doing narration because the ability to hear what the mic hears. Um, yeah, you know, without any huge, delay yeah. is, is, yeah, monumental. Um, but so advice for people looking to do their own narration stuff. Um, I would just say do it. Just start doing it. Um, and if they're looking to follow a schedule, definitely build up a backlog before you even tell anybody that you're doing this. Um, because having that buffer will help you maintain your sanity tremendously. Um, I know when I had, you know, like a two month buffer at one point, I think probably the only point, uh, it was just such a wonderful feeling. <laughs> um, whereas most times like I'd be coming home every day from work thinking like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe I'm going to have to cancel my plans and record tonight because the chapter airs, you know, at midnight. Um, so another recommendation, don't do an, an overly aggressive release schedule if you're doing a schedule at all. Um, and, oh, actually, if you're looking to gain some experience, uh, the Reddit Record This subreddit um, does a monthly, uh, I believe they call them sound checks. Um, and basically it's the mod posts some... Uh, you know, blocks of text, usually ads, things like that, um, for people to just record and everybody gives each other feedback. And uh, it's extremely helpful. Uh, I, I got a lot of great tips through doing that. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with it, too. Like once you start feeling like you're hitting your stride and, um, you know, it's you've, you've developed your narration voice, uh, you can start doing some really funky things like taking this ad that's all serious and doing a crazy voice for it, but trying to do it well. And, uh, 
yeah, yeah it's it's a great way to to just build up experience and get a lot of very very good constructive feedback uh you know very easily awesome that's great advice i kind of want to <laughs> try out that subreddit actually oh yeah no it's a lot of fun and i just really liked your your just do it advice because we that's pretty much how we started this podcast we were just like yeah. hey let's just try, try this and just just yeah. make it happen yeah i mean yeah. I, I think things work the best and you can go back and listen to our first episodes and i think like you it's like wow did we sound that like, yeah. were, our mics were that bad like i didn't oh yeah i didn't do anything to the audio file it was just like just cut it and then post it mm-hmm. um yeah yeah awesome um yeah, well, thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, did you have any? Did you have anything else you wanted to to just to just tell everybody out there? Um, I don't think so. I think we we covered most of it. Uh, just you know, tell your friends, <laughs> get everybody into Worm. If they don't like reading. Tell them about the audiobook. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 true. That is a good. Uh, in fact, that's that's how I've got a couple people hooked in. Is is uh, people who who just like us have commutes not really practical for them to sit down and read a, a million plus words, but, but, but yeah. uh, an audio book is a completely different matter. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So th- thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. And uh, everybody check out the warm audio book if you haven't done that. And we're back to the mailbag. All right. Uh, next question from Cognito. At one point, one of you mentioned that you don't like the protectorate leadership, but do like all the low level heroes. While it's true that most of the protectorate heroes are well-intentioned, do you think it would be possible to construct a superhero organization that isn't pro-status quo in the warm world? And if not, might the protectorate's corruption be a structural inevitability? Yeah, and I think uh, this was one Cognito wrote like a an essay, a fabulous essay about status quo within the warm world and how uh, some people were presented another and he used um, the different uh, sexes of the characters as a, as a great way of, of showing that um, in the hero group, there's usually more women than there are men, which is seemingly like different from what status quo normally is. It, it's a really great post. Like go check the Reddit thread and read it. It's really wonderful um, to answer the question as quickly as I can to respond to that big, long question uh, statement. Like it's the point of a law enforcement agency to uphold the status quo. Like, so a, a, a government or military organization is always going to be pro status quo because that's what their job is. Um, they don't write the laws. They don't change the laws. They just enforce the laws as written. So whatever is decided the status quo, they are going to uphold that. And I think the real big issue in the protection protectorate has been the cauldron corruption of that central tenant, specifically Alexandria existing as both the person who writes the laws and the person who upholds the laws. And I think there's a reason in real in the real world why we keep these things as distinct as possible in our government. Like we like perceived influence is as bad as real actual influence when it comes to this stuff in in the United States government. So like we treat it very seriously. Um, that's a little bit of a tangent, I guess. But I, I do think that corruption is kind of just an inevitable thing in any kind of organization on the planet because human beings are human and no matter who they are if they're heroes if they're villains if they're public employees if they're private citizens if there's a way to cheat there are going to be some people that find that way to do it and the trick is to develop a system that not only protects against that kind of cheating but but ferrets it out and punishes those responsible for it and I think we've seen that the protectorate does have kind of their own like internal affairs. Like we see little hints about it, like kid win breaks code with some of his weapon designs and gets punished for it. But that system has also showed that we let people that break the rules go free. Um, arms master escapes without being public punished. Alexandria and Idolan seemingly are just going to get away with stuff as well. And we talked about this a little last week and I understand the reasoning behind this, that the too big to fail notion of it. But, um, when you breed that kind of that that kind of lack of consequences into your organization, it will always, always, always end up corrupted. So <laughs> to come full circle on this question, um, and I think this is a question that Worm continually asks, can traditional forms of government and traditional behaviors of a civilized society exist in a world in which one person has the power to kill millions without breaking a sweat? 
And it seems like so far the answer to that question is no, these kind of norms can't hold up in a world where one person is granted that kind of power. Um, and, and that's very interesting. So I think I think I kind of answered his question in a long roundabout way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think you you covered it. I, I don't I don't even really have anything to add. I think you you hit all the main uh, points of, of relevance there. Um, it's it's difficult to conceive of a anti status quo organization that was heroic rather than is sort of gravitating toward being villainous. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to add any more to that because, because that was, I that talked was for like five minutes. Sorry. Yeah. And, Sorry and I mean, that. you just, you just covered everything. So that's good. <laughs> uh, Pita Enigma asks, uh, what interlude would you find most interesting? Are there side characters you want to see more of even characters who were just alluded to? I feel like Pita Enigma is trying to, to fish for me to say, I want to see more of gray boy. It sort of feels like, <laughs> So I'm going to say Grey Boy. Um, as far as what interlude I want to see, uh, I Dolan I, a lot. Like, I really want to see from his point of view. I really want to see what's going on in this guy's head, especially after all the events of the last arc. So uh, last time when I said Emma, uh, I got that. So maybe we're going to do that again. Let's uh, let's make it happen. Yeah, I, uh, I will pass on this one. Green Door 65 asks uh, at this point what is your opinion of the protectorate and prt in general now that information has been revealed do you think that it is still a heroic organization what f- reforms do you believe it needs um and then what, what would be your ideal solution to the problem of the triumvirate taking in, into account both justice and practicality assuming that they will cooperate within reason yeah so <laughs> Um, This kind of touches on Cognito's question a little bit, but there's a different enough that I'll answer it anyway. Um, I think it's a heroic organization because the majority of the people joined up specifically because they wanted to contribute and and be heroes and do the right thing. So technically, yes, although, like I said, there's a there's a a rod at the core of it that I think needs to be addressed. And like like I mentioned before, the problem is that a lot of the ways in which you would traditionally reform or establish establish oversight over a group or entity don't work when superpowers become involved because you would you would uh, have reporting you would have like you, you can never be sure that the person that's providing that oversight is not working for the organization in the first place and that thinking about that led me down to a ro- road of like I wonder if it's people working for the government being in this organization having secret identities is part of the problem because Alexandria couldn't have also been Rebecca Costa Brown if everyone knew who Alexandria was. So there, there are super serious consequences towards unmasking these people as well. I understand that. But maybe like if you're at the level of management, like maybe having a secret identity, not knowing who you are is not a good thing. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know how you fix it in this world. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, I like to kind of base it in in reality, like, 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 and this is a a real question. Like, do you, listener, think that that what the, the law enforcement agency in your country is a heroic a, a heroic organization? Um, and I think all kinds of people would have all kinds of answers to that. I mean, yeah, they're they're typically anybody who goes into law enforcement um, is going to be taking on extremely um difficult challenges that that normal people never have to never have to contemplate um and that by itself to me makes me view you know law enforcement professionals as as heroes essentially you know according to my own definition and that's one thing we've talked about before is like there are a lot of different working definitions of of hero that uh that can serve uh different functions um so, so like, is is the protector it's still a heroic organization? Well, it's full of, it's full of individuals who are putting themselves in harm's way to protect people. So in that regard, it is. Um, but it also has some corruption. But then again, literally every organization on the planet, larger than one person, probably has <laughs> some corruption. So right, and I think that's that's a great reflection on on the the police force in in our country right now. That there are many good people in that in that organization that are. You're exactly right. Going out there every day and risking their lives, those people are heroes. Um, but that doesn't mean that the organization by itself doesn't have massive problems that need to be addressed. 
And yeah. I think that's what sometimes people forget when you start speaking badly against police or the, the or the organization surrounding police that you're not you're not attacking the individual officers. Just like here, I'm not attacking like I can say the PRT has some problems. The protectorate has a rot at the core of it without saying, I think you clock blocker are a bad person. And yeah, and like I think that's true to life. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. OK, um, next question from Calinero. Nine eight five. Has reading Worm changed the way you think about or consume more traditional superhero content? Assuming that Worm got adapted into a series or of films or, or TV show, uh, what director style do you think would be best uh, the best fit for it? Or at least uh, what whose take on it would be, would you be most interested in uh, in seeing? Um, and then uh, yeah, so so I, I'll I'll take this one first. The, the big reason that Scott is reading this story in the first place is that every time he and I would talk about Marvel or, or DC movies um, or, or comic books or heroes in general, uh, superheroes in general, which, which was a lot, I would inevitably go on a huge rant, ranting tangent <laughs> about um, how, you know, so many of these things were done better in Worm and Worm's approach to this issue was just so much cleaner and the world created in Worm is just so much more coherent. Um, so, and and I did I did that luckily without spoiling much I think um, but but like it, it clearly clearly it affected my thinking about about superhero stories quite a bit um, and I don't know about Scott but Worm genuinely makes me just like other superhero stuff less like like it's it's it just all seems it's just an unfinished to me now <laughs> in, in comparison I don't know Scott what what do you think Yeah I mean I don't I don't fully disagree with you i mean i i do compare other superhero stuff i see to worm now sure but i think like like it's you, you always have to measure against what they're trying to do like i really enjoy the marvel movies but they are not trying to accomplish the same things worm is trying to accomplish at all they are these kind of uh just trying to be fun exciting like sometimes emotional jaunts into this magical world that they don't want to like get down into the details of how that world works. They don't care. They just like, it, it's a, it's their popcorn movies. They, you, just, you don't, like, you don't have to use your brain very much. You, you don't have to think about it. It's not that complicated of a world. Um, and they don't want to have those deep intellectual discussions that, that this work breeds. So to me, it's kind of apples and oranges, uh, uh or crypt apples and worm and just, yeah. That but, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I I enjoy but them both quite a lot. Um, do I think yeah. that Worm is a great example of what superhero fiction can be? Absolutely, it's phenomenal. It's great, but uh, there are most other superhero things I see are not trying to be what Worm is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if this comparison makes sense, but like, it's not like you can't enjoy Harry Potter just because you enjoy The Wheel of Time. Um, because Wheel of Time has a fairly coherent magic system, whereas Harry Potter has a nonsense magic system. It's to just they're, totally they're di nonsense. different stories trying to do different things. Hey, Matt, if, yes. if a time turner exists as a magical artifact, it means that a spell can be cast to do the same thing, which breaks the entire world, and it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but it's a self-consistent time loop, Scott. So. Okay. Um, the, the, I, I didn't actually think in advance about which director style would be the best fit for Worm. I mean, I, I, I don't... I don't know. Um, Here, here's how I'm going to answer this question. Um, it's fun to talk about what an adaptation of the story would look like. It's a lot of fun. Of course it is. It's always fun to talk about this thing. It's always fun to fan cast. It's always fun to fan crew. Um, I would be terrified if an adaptation was actually ever made. Um, based on what I've seen of what Game of Thrones has become, um, I have have lost any faith in the ability of people to adapt complicated literary works and i don't i just don't know if i would even want it anymore i mean I, i'd love for it to happen because it means wild Bo would get a crap ton of money and be <laughs> celebrated for the thing that he's created but i just think it would break it um it, it, it would break it to the point where it's almost unrecognizable anymore yeah i i think like i think people have said before that that it it would make sense as as an animation product of some form i, I don't you don't necessarily have to say anime, just some kind of animated way of doing it because that gives you um, 
different a different set of constraints than like oh we're gonna make an HBO series out of Worm like that's I don't know if that would quite work. Um, God, I'd, yeah. I'd be terrified. Yeah. Uh. Um, and and then uh, uh, Calimero also asked if there are any other uh, stories or serials that might scratch the worm itch. Um, like, I don't know if they scratch the itch, but like I've 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 read I read Unsong. I like that. It doesn't. I don't think it scratches the worm itch really. Like it it it's a it's aimed at kind of a different audience and it doesn't doesn't uh doesn't do the things worm does um i guess harry potter and the methods of rationality like is kind of like it it, it does do a lot of the similar things but it's you have to be up for a very long harry potter fan fiction which some people are are not um i'm gonna read that one day matt you've been telling me about that almost as long as worm yeah, yeah, I, I have been, but it's always with it's always been with more caveats than I've <laughs> than I've applied to worm. Yeah, maybe that's why I haven't started yeah. a whole podcast about it yet. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are podcasts about it, but oh, I'm sure. Um. Yeah. So that's my, um, that's that's my response to that. So next we have from the joke G. <laughs> well done. Who actually specified their pronunciation for us, and I. I uh, think I tried to do as, as, as well as I could. Um, you've talked uh, you've talked a lot about Wild Bro's fantastic naming gift, and it's obvious that names have a certain power to them. How does this reflect on the protectorate's forced naming of Skitter? If Taylor were given a choice in the matter, do you think she would have chosen a different name? Um, what about the Skitter uh, of the Echidna arc? Has she grown into... Um, has she grown into the name and would she pick a new one given the chance? Uh, do you think that she would have the same rep if she was named flutter or bug girl? So I really, really liked this question. Um, because I, I think I, I do think, and I think we said at the time, but I just want to reiterate that, that skitter being named by someone other than herself is, was such an important beat because she it's, it's literally letting other people define who she is. And that's just like she was doing with her bullies and, and with her kind of pre Cape life that she was allowing other people to define who she is. Um, and, and, and it worked story wise because at the time Taylor was just like, Oh, this name's only temporary. I'm going to quit this group after a while and I'm going to have to rebrand when I become a hero. Um, so she didn't really care about what the name is, but, it, but it serves as this really powerful metaphor at the time. Now, yeah, um, I think today's Taylor would pick her own name if she could, but but she still might pick Skitter because she loves using the, the, that that fear and uncomfortable uncomfortable situation as a tool in her toolbox, and and the name Skitter is one of those tools. It's one of her methods of of kind of scaring or intimidating people into uh, subservience. Yeah. I, I got some pushback last time I said something along these lines, but like, I feel like if she was going to change her name one way or the other, it would either be like much softer or much harder because Skitter is actually kind of, it doesn't emphasize the most terrifying aspect of her power, which, yeah. you know, would be a name like Swarm or something, you know, which I, I think someone told me that's already a name in, in, uh, in comic books. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's like, skitter skitter doesn't quite get across how terrifying she can be if, if anything uh, okay next question from maroon sweater how does the coil slash echidna section of the story rank compared to the leviathan slash uh, slaughterhouse nine section so basically i guess we've divided like and i don't even know how accurate this is but we've divided uh worm so far into three different sagas the leviathan saga which really was just the beginning and um ended happened to end at the leviathan attack the slaughterhouse nine section and then the coil section which ended with the echidna stuff that's how we've chosen to, to divide them so i guess this question is how would i rank those compared to each other um i think that there is moments in this part of the story that have the best writing i've ever seen um, I think there are interludes here and there are moments with Taylor that I just think are just so fantastic and so wonderful and, and some of my favorite moments in the book. However, I think generally, I think I enjoyed from a high level the Slaughterhouse-Nine portion of the book a little more. 
I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, I, I just felt like it was very narratively satisfying to me. Um, and in, in a way that this just wasn't as much. And I wish I could extrapolate on that more, but I, I still kind of processing that. And I, I, I'm just not sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like there was a lot more intricacy to the Slaughterhouse Nine section. Yeah, I think um, that's fair. This, there's, there's simply, and maybe that sounds ridiculous since we just got out of like a huge battle of, of tons and tons of capes, but it's like we were, we were able to go relatively deep on a relatively wide range of characters in, in this S nine. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, you, there's definitely a, a big conversation to be had there because I, 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 I like, I like all of it, but I kind of agree that there are some people, there's some people who, who like really don't like certain parts of worm and really do like other parts. I, I'm actually, actually like all of worm. This may come as a, as a shock to everyone as the person who, <laughs> loves it so much that they made a podcast about it, but I actually, <laughs> actually like all of it. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you that like the, the S nine arc works for me in, in ways that little else in the world does though. So, yeah, I mean, and I, I want to make it clear that like, that's, I'm doing that because someone asked me to compare them and rank them. Like, yeah. I certainly like, yeah. like when you rank things, there's like it, it, the difference between the slaughterhouse nine arc and the echidna, coil arc to me is very small um but if someone's going to force me to rank them i'm going to put one above the other but the the difference between them is so minute that it almost it doesn't matter i enjoy yeah. the hell out of this part of the story yeah right um and then <laughs> maroon sweater also asks you to talk about plot holes yeah and i think this was a result of a conversation that we were having in the discord where um <laughs> someone asked me about plot holes and I think I was just whining about how a lot of people use the phrase plot hole to mean uh, something that it doesn't mean. So a plot hole is not when something happens in a story and you don't understand it or a, a, a plot hole is not a dangling thread that does not need to be closed. A plot hole is specifically when something happens that goes against the rules established in the world and it, 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 it there's no connection between those two things so I think in the discussion, someone specifically mentioned that um, that uh, director Pigo not using Amy's healing power or not using a healer to heal the problem she had with uh, her I think kid was a kidney or liver or I think it was kidneys yeah, yeah. with her kidneys was a plot hole um, and that's like a, a fairly popular opinion amongst people. That's not. That's not a plot hole. <laughs> That's not what a plot hole is. Even if you disagree with the in-world explanation of why that didn't happen, that is not what a plot hole is. And I think we tend to overuse the term plot hole. And I just wanted an opportunity to rant about that for a sec. So um, stop using yeah. plot hole incorrectly. Yeah. That one specifically bothers me because it's like, what, you, you mean the character who specifically hates and fears and distrusts capes is yeah. is gonna yeah is, and and who is who has like a weird chip on her uh, chip on her shoulder about having been injured in the line of duty she's gonna she's gonna put herself up for for uh cape healing yeah yeah it's ridiculous uh, yeah uh foxtail asks why is vista so adorable because foxtail just just because yeah that's correct moving on ben zemo asks up to this point in reading are there any characters or scenes that you wish there was fan art for um i, I kind of like scanned through the story and there's actually a, like a bunch that, that pretty much go through the podcast and hear any time we were like oh man i wish there was an image of this um that like I, I would love more dragon fan art specifically. That's just one that I remember thinking like, man, these, a lot of this is very cinematic and there's just something about big dragon looking robots that I really want to see with my eyes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, more fan art's always good. I think there's a, a really fantastic amount of fan art for this thing so much so that every episode we've been able to find something that fits with the, the events of the episode so far. Um, we've had to stretch that a little bit at times. And I think the dragon, uh, the, the dragon suits portion was a specific moment where we had to stretch it. I don't know if the image we used for that episode was actually a picture of one of dragon's mechs or not, or if we just found was, something that kind of looked like it was. Yeah, I think it was not. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, so that's, that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think fan art's good, and I think that's part of the reason we do the fan art contest, and I think we're going to have an, another one come up here pretty soon um, because we like to see more of it, and it's it's a, some, there's so many talented talented artists that are making art for this thing. Yeah. So keep doing it, guys. It's awesome. Yeah, we love it. Pizza Hot Dog Lover asks or, or, or says, uh, Dina was Taylor's project. Taylor was Tattletale's project. And in the same way, Emma was Sophia's project. Does this suggest that there is something about being a cape that makes you want to shape other people in some way? Maybe. Um, I think there's like a, a, a human trait that you want to do that. Um, I think especially if you you subscribe to a certain belief or lifestyle that you want other people to believe in that thing too because it gives it an air of legitimacy if you have other people supporting the things that that you believe in i think that's part of the big reason that that sophia wanted to bring emma in to her prey or predator thing because she wanted someone else to buy into her bullshit that and that makes her feel better about it um i don't know like his I, like i don't think I don't think Taylor was like trying to shape Dinah, just rescue her. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, there's probably like there's probably some passenger stuff going on. Like, I think I think I, I fully think that Lisa's passenger um, encouraged her by using her trauma to interact with Tattletail um, um, or, or interact with Taylor. Sorry. Um, because, and she used the fact that, that this was her trauma. It used the fact that, that this is the thing that she cares most about to put these two people together. You could argue that the same thing happened with Sophia, that she was egged on by her passenger to, um, to interact with Emma in some way. So I I guess you could say, yes, possibly. I I think we've seen that the passengers are subtly influencing behavior in one way or another. So it would not surprise me if, that is a commonality amongst capes due to the passengers that they're being influenced to, uh, to, to influence kind of. Yeah. I think in all three cases, um, what the, what the superior in in the interaction is seeking is validation. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, it's not even so much that they're trying to like dye someone in their color. It's, it's more that they're trying to get some, some reflection that, that, what they're doing is right. Um, and they're trying to, to basically show it to someone else and say like, Hey, 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 look, this is, this is how you should, this is how you should do it. And it's kind of a desperation to it. It's an interesting question. Yeah. All right. Next, the Bishop eight, uh, says you ranked tattletale low among the undersiders on Twitter after you read arc 19 part one, have the rankings changed now that you know her backstory? Uh, can you explain how you rank them in more detail? See, I knew I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> um, here's what my original Twitter ranking was, if any of you want to know. Uh, I had Taylor, then Rachel, then Alec, then Aisha, then Lisa, and then Brian at the bottom. <laughs> uh, so first of all, anything I do on Twitter is like spur of the moment, stream of consciousness type stuff that I give very little actual thought to. Um, that's kind of the point of live reaction and that kind of stuff. I, I, I am intentionally not trying to trying not to think about it too hard and the the specific reason why lisa ended up so low on the list was probably just because i finished a section where she was being like really reckless and cagey and annoying um to me at least like i was annoyed that she wasn't filling me and and by by extension taylor in on what was going on um would would the ranking be different today probably uh am i gonna rank them again nope <laughs> <laughs> not gonna do it um, and, and that goes kind of into the, the ranking of the sections that like, I don't want this to be a co- contest. I like all these characters a lot. I do. I like them all. And I ranking them was a fun little thing in the moment, but it seems artificial and unnecessary. And it, it, it tends to indicate that maybe I don't like some of them and that's not true. So. Yeah. And, and they're all really different characters. Yeah. So placing them on a continuum of like, this person is better. It's like, well, bet, what does that mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Manu on YouTube says, uh, Scott, when do you think, uh, when and how do you propose that your theorized prison break is going to happen? Uh, Wednesday, October or August 14th, uh, 2011 at 7.53 a.m. And it's going to be via um, superpowers. Okay. 
All right. I, I actually have. I, I don't know. I, I yeah. just every time we reinforce how inescapable the prison is, like an alarm goes off in my head that says, well, the people are going to escape from the prison. Yeah. Uh, via email, Stranger12 asks uh, or uh, poses this interesting question. Cauldron arrives on your doorstep and offers you a vial of your choice for three undisclosed favors. Knowing what you do so far, do you personally accept or decline? Why? And if you accept, what do you request for the vial to do? So if this question was asked uh, a month ago, uh, I think it would be a lot harder to answer. But knowing what we know about Cauldron right now, hell no. I'm not going to I'm not going to get involved with them at all. Yeah, I, I feel like the answer to this question changes a lot over the course of the the story yeah and i'm sure um, it'll change again i'm sure it will knowing wild bow like we're gonna we're gonna find a, a way to justify everything cauldron's been doing in a way that complicates them and and enters them into an area of gray where i i toss and turn at night trying to figure out what i think <laughs> about this um but and, right now no and and as i've put on the record before i would prefer mover power so uh if anyone <laughs> if anyone out there is listening and is you know capable of helping me there I would I would like a mover power. Thanks. Man, Matt, when I was a little kid, I was seriously convinced that I was going to get Spider-Man's power somehow. Like like legitimately, I convinced myself that was going to happen. Yeah. This takes See, me back I, to that. I think for a long time I was pretty sure that psychic phenomena were real. So I was like really like trying to develop those um <laughs> for, for a while. Um <laughs> so that, I guess that would be a thinker power but uh I no no so, i've yeah. given up on that dream i would oh, yeah. I, I pick mover okay all right um I, is this the last question i think we are on the last question did we do the wow knocked in nibble on reddit ask i know scott kind of sort of answered this on the twitter but does matt want to do a twig read through um personally i think it's better than worm and i think you guys might enjoy it more for the same reason it's absolutely even better of a character focused story than worm um, they kind of go on talking about how awesome Twig is for a while, which I agree with. Um, and also points out that there's a cool gimmick that they won't talk about that makes the action scenes into basically extended character moments. And I'm pretty sure I know what they're talking about there. Um, and, and my comment was, uh, uh, Maynard, the singer from tool says that when people ask him about like, when is the next tool album coming out while he's like in the middle of some other project, he it's kind of like asking a woman who's in labor when they're going to start trying for their next child, um, which which is just to say I, I love I love Twig. I'm really enjoying Twig. Um, I'm I'm not sure at this point if if it lends itself to this specific format nearly as well as as Worm does for various reasons, although some sort of podcast about Twig might you know be 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 quite possible. Um, but all that being said, I don't think I'll I'll really be able to objectively consider this until we're done with Worm and um, and that's complete and I can, I can really kind of objectively assess what the next thing should be. Just one week, Matt. I just want to go through one week without you referencing tool. Just, I'm sorry. Just one, just one. It's not going to happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think we're, we're coming. And the reason I moved this question to last is because we're coming down the home stretch now. We're, we're leaving this mailbag and we're not going to do another one theoretically, Probably. before before we're done with this book so um we have in the back of our minds started thinking about what the future beyond this book holds for us we have some ideas um i think the ideas i i would love to do something with twig sometime down the road i don't think it's going to happen right after we're done with worm um i i will not speculate on when it would be i don't want to get anyone excited for anything um we are we are going to do more things and we are going to announce it formally and officially uh when it get, comes closer to time but um right now i don't know yeah i, I think i don't know is the is the succinct answer yeah. for both of us yeah um okay uh well that's it for this edition of the mailbag uh, as always we appreciate your feedback and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. You can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. I'm doing my ARC 20 live read tomorrow 
at noon central time because um, I'm going away next week. So we are going to be on a weird schedule uh, for the next two weeks. Um, we're actually recording the ARC 20 podcast later this week and then ARC 21 early next week. Um, they're still going to go up at the same time as usual. Um, everything's going to be the same from your end, but that's why the, the live read of ARC 20 is going to be a little earlier than normal. Um, you can also find me on Twitter personally at Scott Daly 85. That's D A L Y. And Matt is at more <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, uh, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. As always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. Last week, we debuted our book club for the first time, talking about Good Omens. It was a great conversation that you can watch now on our YouTube channel. Uh, we already have our book lined up for next month, which is uh, Philip Pullman's The Golden Compass, or Northern Lights if you're in the United Kingdom. Um, we've already scheduled that. It's going to be October 6th to Friday at 930 p.m. central time uh so get reading it and, and join us we'll make sure to announce that multiple times before we get there but we we have set it so mark your calendars that's right um and we also have the first episode of the so-called writers out so so check that out um we also have a patreon page patreon.com slash daily planet films uh, if you like what we do here and you want to help make sure we keep doing more consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford we've got a lot of new donations this week scott here we go uh, New Planeteers, Ryan, Coltrane, Sophie, Peta Enigma, Prof Hoyden, Connor, Kevin, Frustrated Freeboda, New Captain's Planet, Kate, the Coffee Guru, and Marcus. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. We're, we're continually floored by your donations, guys. Thank you so much for supporting us. We promise not to let you down. And as always, um, also make sure you stop by Wildbo's page and toss some money there because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. And if you can't spare any extra cash at the moment, that's absolutely fine. There are still tons of ways to help us out. Uh, in honor of the mailbag episode, I propose you send a traditional letter to all of your friends and family. Write in quill, seal it with the finest of waxes, and make sure it looks really, really fancy. Um, all it needs to do is say two simple things. Uh, read Worm, uh, and then listen to We've Got Worm, and then uh, sign it in blood. Uh, if that's not too much trouble, uh, or if that is too much trouble, rather, you can also rate and review us on iTunes. And guys, we don't have any new reviews this week. We're out of reviews. So we really need you guys to get on it so we can have some new reviews to read or else this segment of the show is just really awkward. Yeah, it's just going to it's just going to be this. <laughs> I'm just going to be silent for the amount of time it would take me to normally read a review. Uh, yeah. No, th there is something I did want to touch on real quick here. Um, a, a few days ago, we got an email from a listener, Heather. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of the email or, or what she shared with me, but I, I just wanted to give her a personal shout out on the podcast because what she sent to me was, was really touching. And I, I think to you as well, Matt. Yeah. Um, and like, as we wrap up this episode, like we said, we're, we're moving into the home stretch, as it were, of, of this book. We've got 11 arcs to go. We've got 13 episodes. That's still a lot of book, but uh, the, the finish line is, is starting to appear. It's starting to be incited. It's kind of caused me to, you know, sit back and, and take stock and how far we've come so far. Cause you and I have been podcasting for almost three years now. Um, it started as this thing that we thought would be fun, but now this project has moved it into sort of a second job for us. Um, we, we started a business. Uh, I made an income statement last month. We, we have an income statement. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're budgeting things like we have a budget and we've got so many plans for what we want to do here. And, and really for the first time, it seems that they're achievable plans, they're achievable goals. And that's really exciting. It's, it's so exciting, but, but more than any of that, more than any of that stuff, we're for the first time seeing like tangible evidence that what we're doing here is resonating with people. It, it's impacting people. And, 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 and it, it matters to people. And so, Heather, like, I just wanted to thank you so much for, like, taking the time to reach out to us. Like, I'm so happy that you found this book and, and so thankful that our tiny little piece of this book and this world 
has made a difference in your life. So, so thank you so much. Like I, I love, I love doing this. I have so much fun doing it and it, it means so much to me that you guys are responding it to it in the way that you are. Yeah. It, it's, it's really nice to know that you're successfully entertaining people, but it, it's a whole different thing to know that you, that you're actually touching people. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. uh that, that's been amazing. Yeah. Um, all right. That's it for us this week. Next week, we're starting and completing Arc 20 Chrysalis. Scott, what do you think this one's all about? Well, Matt, as you know, a chrysalis is a preparatory or transitional state of an insect pupa, usually of that or a moth or butterfly, according to dictionary.com. Uh, <laughs> so, so my guess is actually, seriously, is that Arc 20 will find Taylor in a, a state of change because Brockton Bay is recovering. Coil is defeated and dead. Dinah is saved. The big bads are seemingly uh, gone or so nebulous that they're not directly in front of us. And, and what is Taylor's changing role in this new world? Uh, as her justifications for this villainy seem to be fading one by one. Uh, what, 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 when she hatches from this, this chrysalis, uh, what will she turn into? You know, the moth or the butterfly? Very interesting, Scott. I guess we'll find out next week on We've Got Worm. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>